today, Lord God, for your mercy, Lord, and for your kindness toward us, Lord God. I pray right now, Lord, a prayer of repentance, Lord God, that you forgive us, Lord God, of all sin, Lord, all iniquity, Lord Jesus, anything we've said or done or thought that is not like you. I pray that you forgive us tonight, Lord God, from all sin, Lord God. Cleanse us, Lord, from all unrighteousness. Father, I pray tonight that you give us clean hands, Lord, and a pure heart, Lord God, that we should ascend unto the mountain, Lord God, to learn of you. I pray, Lord, as we dive into your word, O oh God, that you would give us revelation, give us wisdom, Lord, give us understanding, Lord God, that we should be transformed, molded, and changed into your word, Lord God, to be what you would call us to be, Lord Jesus. We give you tonight the glory. We give you the honor. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody said amen. 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 Praise God. Welcome tonight as we are about to wrap up our third king of, of Israel. Uh, the first king of Israel, his name was Saul, Saul, Saul. What, what, what tribe was Saul from? A Benami, Benjamin, yes. He was, he was, he was, he was, gosh, I can't say it now. He was a Benjamite. Yeah, 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 that's fine. Um, why did they want a king in the first place? Do you remember? They wanted to be like other nations, and they wanted someone to fight their battles for them. Go ahead. Because he didn't want them to be complicit. Plausible deniability. Yeah, they paid the price anyway. But plausible deniability means that because Saul was wicked. And Saul would do whatever he could to kill David. Including kill priests. It's actually not. There's a book I'm reading recently that had plausible deniability in it. And I was like, oh, that, that's, yeah, that's. I'm going to start picking that up. Anyway, um, they wanted a king because they wanted to be like other nations. And the other nations had a king to fight their battles. And why were they losing battles in the first place? Because they weren't obeying the Lord. Correct. Because the, the, the promise that God gave them is that if they will keep his commandments, he would bless them. If they would keep his commandments, God would multiply them. If they would keep his commandments, God would protect them and give them victory over their enemies. And so, uh, all throughout the period of Judges, they suffered many defeats at the hands of their enemies because they kept, continued and failed to, failed to do the word of God, to, to live by the commandments of God. And so... First Samuel chapter number eight, they begged Samuel for a king because they wanted to be like the other nations to have a king to go out and fight their battles for them. Essentially what they wanted, they wanted to keep living like they were living, but have a king that would go and fight the battles for them. They wanted to keep living like they were living, but have a king to go out and fight their battles. Because if they would just live for God, they wouldn't have needed a king to fight their battles. God would fight their battles. It was supposed to be just a continuing battle of Jericho. We live for God. We're going to shout this wall down. God's going to tear down the wall. We'll get victory over our enemies. But that's not how it panned out because they continued to serve and worship other gods, and God would remove his hand of protection. So uh, nevertheless, God said, look, Samuel, they have not denied you. They have denied me, but give them what they want. Tell them that this is what's going to be a king. And then he told him to anoint Saul for king. Saul shows up and he's anointed. He is from the tribe of Benjamin. He's, he's head and shoulders above, above everybody else. He looks like a king, but his heart is not in the place of a king. Specifically, his heart is not toward God. He does not put very much stake in his relationship with God. He's mostly only caring about outward appearance and how he is perceived. He fails two times, notably the last one when he's supposed to kill all of the Amalekites, but he saves the sheep, some men, and the king alive. Um, at this point, God decided to turn from Saul and come to a man 
after his own heart, and that man was David. David was the youngest son of who? Jesse. He had how many older brothers? Seven. He wasn't even invited to his own anointing ceremony. All of his older brothers passed before Samuel's horn, and God said, I have not chosen any of these. You look at the outward appearance, but man, God is judging the heart. And so David is found keeping his father's sheep. He's anointed to be king over Israel. The next chapter, a few chapters, he kills Goliath and establishes himself in Saul's army to the point where they start singing David's praises. Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And we know Saul doesn't care nothing about but what his image is. So as soon as the populace starts to praising David more than they praise Saul, he gets offended at David and tries to hunt him down and to kill him. That pretty much wraps up the rest of the first, first book of Samuel until Saul finally dies in battle by his own sword. David rises up over uh, as, uh, as king of Judah first at Hebron and then is anointed king over all of Israel. Um, and David made some mistakes as well. Um, David was a mighty conqueror. He fought and won lots of battles. He slew many giants, but he also had a sin from, uh, with, with Miss, Miss Bath, Bathsheba. Um, he also did some great things. He had a heart and mind to build a house for God. And it was that, it was that desire to build God in house that prompted God to establish what we call the Davidic Covenant. It is the covenant that God gave to David that his seed would forever sit on the throne that is at Jerusalem. So God made that promise to David that David's seed would always sit on the throne. This is why Jesus is called the son of David, because he would have had to come from the lineage of David to be qualified to sit on the throne. Now, am I making sense? That all came because David had a heart to build God in house. But God said, you're not going to do it because you're a man of war. And so God, God uh, then said that his seed or his son would do it. And that son would be the second son of David and Bathsheba, Solomon. Solomon. And we talked about Solomon's introduction as David is old in age and passes away. Solomon rises up to be king in David's stead. And God gives Solomon a blank check. And what does Solomon ask for? He asked for wisdom. And because he asked for wisdom, God gave him riches. God gave him power and everything else. Um, and he also gave him uh, the ability to be able to build the house of God. That's what we talked mostly about last time was his, him building the house of God, offering sacrifices, the Lord's glory coming into that house, and God responding and saying, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, uh, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, and I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. All of that happened at the dedication of the temple. So Solomon really is known for his wisdom and ruling at a time of peace. Um, but he, like all men, has a flaw. And his flaw we're going to talk about today. So let's turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Kings chapter number 11. And we're going to start in verse 1. We'll probably go through 11, 12, and 13 today. 1 Kings chapter 11. Start in verse 1 if you could. You're my reader today? Okay, go ahead. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonites, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as it was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did his father. Then did Solomon build in high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all the strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which appeared unto him twice. All right, pause right there. So Solomon's trouble is this. He had a lot of wives. He had 
first of all, 700 wives and 300 concubines. He had a whole mega church of wives and women. Yes, sir. Huh? But yeah, well, not for the kings. You don't really see average men having these many wives, but the, 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 the kings were given this, this privilege, I guess. Uh, not that God ordained this. He tolerated this. Jesus clarified it up. He said, from the beginning, it was not so. He said, therefore, shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife. You only get one man. Don't try nothing silly. I'm only, I'm only looking at you guys. Don't, don't try nothing silly. Talking about a, a Solomon had many. You're not as wise as Solomon. Nor are you a king. And, and the all has been fulfilled. <laughs> so we have been reconciled back to the beginning. So you get one at best. And even that's not a given. The Lord said marriage is not for everybody. Praise God. Welcome, Sister Billy. Coming on the perfect note. Thank you, Jesus. A amen. And so part of Solomon's diplomatic strategy was taking of these women. And these women came in with their gods. This is not a new strategy. This is how it happened in the Garden of Eden. The enemy creeps in through the wife. And this is not the last time this is going to happen. Now, women, I'm not blaming you guys for everything. I'm just, just pointing out a consistent theme in Scripture. The enemy did not go to Adam directly. He went to Eve. And it was through Eve that Adam made the decision to disobey the commandment of God. Uh, it was the enemy that went through Sarah that prompted Abraham to lay with Hagar to produce Ishmael. It was the enemy that went through Rebekah that prompted her to have her son lie and get the birthright. You seeing a pattern here? The enemy always goes through the feminine character because the feminine character represents the church. Are we picking up on this? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for wives. Submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. So the enemy will try to corrupt the people of God to disobey God. You had your hand up. Go, go ahead. Yes, 100%. 100%. And so in this instance, this is why Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians, Second Corinthians 6, be ye not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. He said, because you can't really have fellowship. Light can't have communion with darkness. Temple of God can't have fellowship with devils. Um, there is a necessity for both of you to be on the same foundation spiritually. Because what happens is, these women that he loved, they turned his heart away from God because they came with their own gods. And some of these people should stick out. Let's look at these gods. Verse number five. Solomon went after Ashtoreth, god of the Zidonians. And after Milcom, the abomination of the Amorites. He did evil, verse six, in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as David his father. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh. The abomination of Moab. Who are the Moabites and the Ammonites? Lot's two daughters. Remember those two? They, 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 they fled from uh, Sodom and Gomorrah uh, only to go down to Zoar and then got scared in Zoar and went into a cave. And they thought they were by themselves. No other man left on the earth. So they got father drunk and laid with him and produced two boys, Moab and Benami. Um, which is the Ammonites and the Moabites. And this is not the first time that the Moabites women have caused problem for the children of Israel. It happened in the book of Numbers when uh, King Balak sent the Moabite women into the children of Israelite to get them to cause fornication, to get them to lay with the Moabite women, and they brought their God, Baal. 
<laughs> right in there, Baal Peor, that particular one. And that is actually a warning given in the New Testament. If you go to Revelation 3, the Lord warns against the spirit of Balaam coming into the church. It teaches the people of God to commit sin with these Moabite women because it comes with their gods as well. So it's happened here. It's happened in the Old Testament. It happens when they come back out of captivity. You read the end of the book of Ezra. Ezra has to rebuke all of Israel because as soon as they come back from the Babylonian captivity, they start marrying strange women again. And Ezra's like, what are you guys doing? We already got exiled for 70 years from marrying these strange women the first time. And these strange women, not just your wife is weird. That's not what he's talking about. Praise God. All of us have weird wives. It is what it is. Praise God. <laughs> weird husbands. What they're talking about, these were not women of, of God. They were women from other nations, and they came with their own gods. He said, what are you doing? We married these strange women again. He forced them to divorce their strange wives. Get rid of the children. You go read it. It's in the Bible. Because he understood that this is how the enemy gains a foothold. And from this point in the book of 1 Kings, all throughout the rest of the kings, you're going to see the king that was born, and you're going to see the mother that he was born by. And what you're going to notice is that they hardly, very few of them serve God fully. In the same way that this is said of Solomon, this is just the first one. It says, um, verse number six, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, look, and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Now, David had his own mistakes, but idolatry wasn't one of them. You hear me? David had his own mistakes, but rebellion and idolatry was not one of his mistakes. Which shows you something about the mind of God and the things he tolerates. He didn't rip the kingdom from David for David's adultery. But he ripped the kingdom from Saul from his rebellion. He didn't rip the kingdom from David when David numbered the people. We didn't talk too much about that one. But he did rip the kingdom from Solomon for Solomon's idolatry. And that should teach us something about the God that we serve. He is a jealous God. He said, I'm a jealous God. Yes, ma'am. David numbered the people, took a census of the people he wasn't supposed to. So it caused a, huh? Yeah. God told him not to. And spiritually speaking, their strength was never in their numbers. Their strength was strength within the fact that God was behind them. So numbering them was seen as a sign of trying to figure out the strength of your army without the power of God. Yes, ma'am. I'll come to you next. There's a high risk of deformities and incest, I, I hear. I have never actually seen it or can confirm it myself, but I, that, that's what they say. There's a high risk of deformities. I think there are some mid, middle-aged kings and queens because royalty used to be inbreds. You can't keep it all in the family, yeah. Yeah, so during the Middle Ages, there were lots of kind of messed up kings and queens and dukes and all of that because of that very issue. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. I mean, it, it, it could definitely tie into it, um, potentially. That's an interesting connection there. Um, if you total number of the sand, if you can count it, he said, and then the stars as well, uh, pointing to the natural and spiritual seed of Abraham. Um, but I, I, th I think in David's case, if you look at the scenario and the context around it, David was a man of war, and uh, war is a numbers game a lot of times. If you're naturally speaking, but spiritually speaking, um, if you got God on your side, it, the number wouldn't. And also, let me say this, the numbering, and we didn't cover it 
in detail, but the numbering of the people of God is what prompted David to purchase the land in which the temple would be built, Ornan's threshing floor. He purchased that as a place to offer sacrifice of God, which was Mount Moriah, the place where Isaac was offered. And so I think God allowed that to happen for David to acquire the land in which the temple would be built showing that the temple would be a place of sacrifice to stay off plagues, which is what God said when Solomon dedicated the temple. If you pray in this place, I'll heal from heaven, and I'll, I'll heal your land and forgive your sins. So I think there's a lot of connection, but that's an interesting one. I, you know, it would be good to search that out. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so, uh, Brother Wayne and Brother John, go ahead. Not necessarily from Solomon. Jezebel's a few, she's a few uh, lineages later. She's a few generations later. So not, not yet, but she's coming. Yes, sir. Well, again, because of the because of the heart, Saul never had a heart for God. He he you you don't you don't you don't see Saul repenting to get his relationship with God right. You don't see that. What? But you see David doing that a lot. Um. Yeah, and and furthermore. It seems to me that God deals more swiftly with rebellion and idolatry than anything else. It seems to me, if you go throughout the scripture and look at, look at those sins where people, like Korah. <laughs> Moses said, if he dies a natural death, then I'm not a man of God. Then the earth swallowed. Lips open. The lips of the earth open. And then close back up. Like it just wasn't there. So, rebellion and idolatry. I mean, idolatry was the first thing the Lord said. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so, it, it, it's, it's no wonder why God deals so swiftly with that. And, and it seemingly with Solomon, he gave him time to repent. I mean, you got to think about it. 700 wives, 300, you know how long it would take you to marry 700 wives? <laughs> if you marry one a week, you're going to be marrying one for like 10 years straight almost. 52 weeks in a year, yeah, about. 14 years, it would take you to marry all them wives. And that's just 700, not to mention the 300 concubines. And, 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 and this happened over the course of Solomon's life. So God brought this judgment up on Solomon towards the end of his life and said, now, this is what he did. He, he built shrines for Ashtaroth, goddess of the Zidonians, after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, uh, verse 7, he built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech. This is the abomination of the children of Ammon. Molech was the god that they, that they caused their children to go on into the fire. They would sacrifice their children to this god, Molech. And he built high places for his strange wives, which burned incense and sacrificed unto their gods. This is going to be, like I said, it's, going to, it's a common theme that keeps recurring. And the Lord is angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Okay, so let's keep going. Verse number 10.
And he had com- and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my command my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded thee I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant notwithstanding in thy days I will not do it for David thy father's sake but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son mm. howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom but will give a one tribe to thy son David for my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake which I have chosen and the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon mm. hey dad the Edomite he was of the king's seed in Edom Yep. For, when, for it came to pass when David was in Edom, and Joab, the captain of the host, was gone up to bury the slain, mm. after he had smitten every male in Edom. For six months did Joab remain there with all Israel, until he had cut off every male in Edom. That Hadad fled, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him, to go into Egypt, Hadad bringing, being yet a little child. Mm. And they arose out of Midian and came to Paran, and they took men with them out of Paran, and they came to Egypt unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, which gave him a house and appointed him victuals and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so he gave to him to wife the sister of his own wife, the sister of Tapanis, the queen, and the sister of Tapanis bare him Genub. Bath, his son, whom Tophanes weaned in Pharaoh's house, and Jenubath was in Pharaoh's household among the sons of Pharaoh. And when Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers, and that Joab the captain of the host was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, Let me depart, that I may go to mine own country. Then Pharaoh said unto him, But what hast thou lacked with me, that, behold, thou seekest to go to thine own country? And he answered, Nothing, howbeit let me go in any wise. And God stirred him up another adversary, Rezon, the son of Eliada, king of Zobah, and he ga- or Eliada, which fled from his lord Hadazer, king of Zobah. And he gathered men unto him, and became captain over a band. And when David slew them of Zobah, and they went to Damascus, and dwelt therein, and reigned in Damascus. And he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon, besides the mischief that Hadad did. And he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. All right, pause right there. So notice when when God is ready to bring judgment upon Solomon, how does he do it? When God is ready to bring judgment upon Solomon for worshiping these other gods, what does he do? He stirs up his enemies. It was God that stirred up enemies against Israel for their own idolatry. Here we go again. Now, David was able, that shows us David was able to have victory because he never entered into the sin of idolatry. And as long as he did not, God was always on his side. But as soon as they entered into idolatry, God stirred enemies. So what you're seeing, this is the movement of nations. God is stirring up whole nations to come against Israel because Israel is messing up. This is global affairs. This is what I want to point out. Lots of the stuff that's happening in the world is not just because governments are losing their mind. God is the one that orchestrates all of this. And it could be for Israel's on Israel's behalf to get them to a place where he desires them to be. Maybe for their own sin. But notice there's a global shifting right now of enemies People being born and rising up against Israel because of who they are worshiping. Is that connecting in your mind? Just think about that. Because we do a lot of praying and trying to rebuke the enemy, but really, it was their own fault. The reason why Egypt is getting ready to come against them is their own fault. Reason why this army is getting ready to come against them is their their own fault. So essentially, they had the keys to their own victory. All they would have to do is to stop worshiping other gods. Tear down the altars of Molech. Tear down the high places of Chemosh. Tear down all the gods of Moab. Tear down all the god of the Zidonians and the Amorites. If they would do that, God would then give them victory. But I find it interesting that God chose to stir up their enemies because of their disobedience and because of their idolatry. 
who help us, Jesus. So that means if we want to stay victorious, the best thing we can do is to stay out of idolatry. Amen. I don't want God to stir up my enemies for my own foolishness. I don't want God to stir up. Hello. And I believe, help me, Lord, this is coming to America. Because we've, we've gone off and started serving and worshiping other gods. State-sponsored. I talked about it last night. State-sponsored worship of Baal. And you think that's going to go unnoticed because we're Israel's allies. I think we got another thing coming. And so in the same way that God is able to stir up other nations against Israel, God can stir up whatever nations he wants to stir up. Praise God to bring about this end time oh, calamity that, <laughs> that's about to come in this tribulation. I'm trying to tell you, all the moving and organization that nations you see is happening, God is behind it all. Yes, sir. I heard enemy Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah, that was the ultimate. And, and, and good, good point. What we're seeing happening here in 1 King is the beginning of calamity for Israel. Right here, what Solomon introduces is not like it just goes away. Because once this kingdom splits... There's going to be kings over the northern and southern kingdom. And each one of those kings is going to have their own choice whether or not they're going to serve God fully or they're going to worship idols. And they did it so much that the final straw in God's hat for the southern kingdom was, okay, I'm sending you into Babylonian captivity. I'm allowing the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, to come in and lay siege to Jerusalem, destroy the wall, destroy the temple, take all the artifacts and take you into captivity and kill most of you with the sword. That was the end result of their idolatry. But it's starting right here. Well, technically, it, it started a long time ago because the enemy knows how to beat us. He can't beat us fighting toe to toe with us not while God is on our side. What he's got to do is get us to beat ourselves. And he does it <laughs> through the strange women. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, so adversaries are risen up. Let's go a little bit quicker here because we got to get through this. Uh, verse 26. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, in Ephraimite of Zit. Zereda, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow woman, even he lifted up his hand against the king. And this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Milo and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. And it came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite found himself in the way. And he had clad himself with a new garment, and they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take thee ten pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel. Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and will give ten tribes to thee. But he shall take one tribe for my servant David's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. Because that they have forsaken me, and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh the, go Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes, and to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did David his father. Howbeit, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince of all the days of his life for David my servant's sake, whom I chose, because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and will mm. give it unto thee, even ten tribes, and unto his son will I give one tribe, that David my servant might have a light all the way before me in Jerusalem, mm. the city which I have chosen to put my name there. And I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desireth, and shall be king over Israel." 
and shall be if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and wilt walk in my ways, and do that is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as did David my servant did, that I will be with thee, and build thee a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee, and will I for this afflict thy se- the seed of David, but not forever. Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt unto Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Mm-hmm. And the rest of the acts of Solomon and all that he did in his wisdom, are they not written in the books of the acts of Solomon? And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was forty years, mm-hmm. and Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his stead. All right, so now this figure Jeroboam, who was a commander in Solomon's army over the house of Joseph, mighty man of valor. He rose up against Solomon as well. And the prophet met Jeroboam in the way as he's leaving Jerusalem and took his garment, his new garment. You know, the real prophets here, they do some strange stuff. Took his garment and ripped it into 12 pieces. How would you like me to take a shirt off your back and just start? 12 pieces. All right, take 10 of them. Like, why? Can you just have said, told this? Why would you have to rip you know, they're weird people. You have to obey a God, you know, to kind of make a scene out of it. Twig it up. Here's 10 pieces. What's, why am I taking 10? I'll tell you why. Because Solomon's been messing up. And Solomon's been messing up. He's gone and served and worshiped other gods. And he named them the God of Chemosh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the goddess of the Zidonians, Milcom, the God of Ammon. He's, he's done all of this. And so I'm going to give you, Jeroboam, 10 of these tribes. I'm only going to keep one for David because I made David a promise. So Solomon gets mercy because of David. Not <laughs> Solomon gets mercy because I made David a promise. So I'm not going to do it to Solomon. I'm going to give his son one kingdom. I mean one, one tribe. But I'm giving you 10 of them. And now I'm giving you the same commandment I gave to Solomon and David. If you will walk in my ways and keep my commandments and statutes, then I'll establish you. So each one of these men of, I say men of God, each one of these kings coming up in the rest of the book of Kings, that's why it's called Kings, they're going to have their own choice. Are they going to follow God fully or are they going to go over and worship idols? Mm. And so this man of God says, Look, verse uh, 38, and it shall be if thou will hearken unto all that I command thee, will walk in my ways and do that is right in my sight to keep my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did, that I will be with thee and will build thee a sure house as I built for David and will give Israel unto thee. And I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. So Jeroboam now, who is really an Israelite, He rose up against Solomon, and the prophet meets him to give him the opportunity to reign over these kingdoms. And Solomon is at his old age. He ruled for 40 years, and this is the end of his kingdom. The Bible says, verse 43, Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. But his son, Rehoboam, reigned in his stead. All right, let's go to chapter 12, and let's look at the split of the kingdom. And this is probably uh, a good lesson on wisdom here and the lack thereof first kings chapter 12 let's go and Rehoboam went to Shechem for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king and it came to pass when Jeroboam the son of Nebat who was yet in Egypt heard of it for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt that they sent and called him and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam saying thy father made our yoke grievous now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again unto me. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, and which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter? And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, 
Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father hath made our yoke heavy, but to make it thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now, whereas my father did lay you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father has chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old man's counsel that they gave him and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father have made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Uh-huh. Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So when all Israel saw that the king not hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Yeah. Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then king Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Mm. Therefore king Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot, to flee to Jerusalem. Uh-huh. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And it came to pass, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation, and made him king over all Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. You're good. That there was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. All right, pause right there. <laughs> Leadership 101. Now, all this is happening by the by the prompting of God. He's behind this whole thing. But it's interesting to see how this plays out. Solomon's son is Rehoboam. Rehoboam is now king over all of Israel in Shechem. And as he is being coronated, the new king, they come to Rehoboam and said, hey, king, your father put a heavy burden on us. What they're talking about is the tax. Costs a lot of money to build that temple. And pay for all those wives <laughs> and all those altars he built for all those wives and all the incense they was burning. Never mind. We'll keep it moving on that note. <laughs> Cost a lot of money. So they said, King, lighten our burden. Make our yoke easier. And so he does initially the right thing. He goes and takes counsel from the men who sat with his father. Now, what is Solomon known for? Wisdom. What do wise men do? Take counsel from other wise men. The proverb says in a multitude of counsel, there is safety. So if you're a wise man, can you imagine if you're the wisest man, can you imagine who the other people at your table are going to be? These are not no dummies. They advise Solomon, who was the wisest man of all the earth. So these guys know what they're talking about. They know what they're saying, and they tell him to do exactly what he should have done. They said, what do you think I should do? This is what what they said unto him. Look at this. Take note of this, you future leaders. They spake unto him, verse 7, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and will serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be Thy servants forever. Leadership 101. You're not a leader just because somebody gives you a position. I'll say it again. You're not a leader just because someone gives you a position. That's a very low level of leadership. If if you work at a secular job, you probably have managers who you only obey because they have a title to 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 their name. (laughs) <laughs> you got that right. I'm only listening to because you're a manager. But these wise men instructed Rehoboam how to transcend that. He said, they said, look, I know you're king. I know you think you're above everybody else. But let me tell you a secret. If you will serve them, speak good words to them, then they will serve you. Forever. So the answer really to this question is that you really, it's, I know you're king, but you're going to have to strip off your king and become a servant. 
Jesus said the greatest in his kingdom is the servant of all. Hello, somebody. And guess what? Oh, young King Rehoboam wasn't trying to hear all that. I'm the king now. Uh, this goes so many ways, Brother John. This is what the Bible says when it says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself. It means you need to serve. Jesus. I don't have too many husbands in here. Just kind of hallelujah, Jesus. But what do we do, husbands? We come demanding. I'm the man of the house. You need to submit. That's not going to work no kind of way. You can <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's not going to work no kind of way. They're going to rebel. Oh, yeah? Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm going to go over here because you tripping. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. He doesn't want to hear that, though. Why? Because serving is a lot of work. Serving takes humility. It, it, it's, it's a selfless deed. He's the new king, and you want to tell me as king I got to serve? I'm not trying to hear that, Brother John. I'm going to go talk to my, my friends that I grew up with. Talk to my, these dummies. <laughs> That's what we do, bro. Just, we gotta, sometimes we make some stupid decisions. So he's not trying to hear all that because that's the hard way around. Even though it's the right way to go and it's the wise path, he's not trying to hear that. So he goes to his friends and he's like, he tells them the same thing. He's like, I'll tell you what I would do. These dummies, they have no kingdom to lose. They have no dog in this fight. They have no experience. They have no wisdom. They're just puffing him up. You tell them that your little finger is fatter than your father's waist. And my father chastised you with whips and I'm going to beat you with scorpions. I don't even know how you beat somebody with scorpions. Can you imagine getting whooped with a scorpion? <laughs> Lord have mercy. Which is obviously just, just some radical saying. And, and, and he, that, 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 that matches his ego right there. That matches his pride right there. That's an easy thing to do. I'm going to make it worse. Like, who are you? You haven't earned anything from these people. And this is what leadership is about. Especially when it comes in the church. If you're going to be greatest in God's kingdom, you've got to be willing to serve. And praise God. You can't just come barking orders because you'll find that people will not follow you. Now, the irony is this. He took the young men's advice. So God, in one generation, went from the wisest man to the dumbest. <laughs> I knew something was coming eventually. He was holding it in. <laughs> in one generation, they went from the wisest man, Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes, Songs of Solomon, Proverbs, built the house of God. In one generation, all of that wisdom was stripped away. And this man did probably the dumbest thing a new king could do. And thought that, thought that he was going to be able to just kind of skate through this, this, this brazen show of force and power. And he didn't realize what was what was bubbling and boiling up underneath. Because they said, oh, yeah? Let's read it. Verse 16. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to your own house. David. So Israel departed unto their tents. It's like we're done with David. We're done with the house of Jesse, which is a tribe of Judah. So what this is, is those other tribes rebelling and saying, we're done with you. We're not listening to what you got to say. We're not accepting the rulership of the house of Jesse any longer, nor of the house of David. Because remember now, David comes from the house of Jesse. That means all of David's kinfolk are kin to the king. So in the rest of Israel, they see them as the oppressive people. It's like we're done with David. Mm. Then it gets kind of sticky. So verse 19 says, then Rehoboam, uh, king, then king Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore, King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariots to flee Jerusalem. 
So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. Wow. So now, from this point on, for the rest of Scripture, there is no longer a united kingdom of Israel. Israel is the title of the northern ten tribes. Judah is the title of the southern tribe. And they added Benjamin on there and the tribe of Levites when they when tribe of Levites left when they started when they started worshiping other gods. And remember, God gave Jeroboam a promise: if you will follow after me, I'll establish your house. So let's see what he does. We'll finish out chapter thirteen. I mean, chapter twelve today. See what he does. First Kings chapter number twelve. Um, excuse me, chapter number 13, and pick up in verse 24 so we can finish this out on time. 13. 1 Kings thir- uh, 12. Did I say 13? Oh, my bad. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 24. Thus saith the Lord, ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. They hearken therefore to the word of the Lord, and return to depart according to the word of the Lord. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim, and dwelt therein, and went out from thence, and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto the Lord." even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me, and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Mm. Wherefore, upon the king took counsel, and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Mm. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made in house of high places, and made priests of the lowest of the people, Mm -hmm. which were not the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, Mm -hmm. and ordered a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. Are y'all seeing this right here? So this is what happened. Now remember, all of this kingdom business, underlining this, they still serve the same God. Y'all with me? They still serve the same God. They still have the same laws. They still have all the same commandments, including the laws that required the children of Israel to go to Jerusalem three times a year to be present for some feast, Passover, um, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles. They had to go to Jerusalem for that. And so Jeroboam is sitting there like, wait a minute now. Look at verse 27. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord. So he's afraid That if he lets all of them go back to Jerusalem during the feast to worship, their heart will turn back to the Lord and back to Rehoboam. Uh Uh-oh. So this is what he said. He said, here's what I'm going to do. Verse 28. Look at this. Where, Where have we seen this before? He made two calves of gold. Where have we seen that before? Say it louder. Exodus. He made two calves of gold. And said, look at this, verse 28. Uh, I could preach on this like all night. It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now, we don't have a map up here, but I wish I did. I could show you. If you look at the northern kingdom of Israel, Bethel was at the south of the northern kingdom. Dan was at the north, the very tippy top, tippity top, will probably be Galilee in the New Testament, the very top. So what he did, instead of them all coming down to the southern kingdom to go and worship, he set up golden calves and said, these be thy gods, O Israel. You would think 
you would think they would remember, like the last time this happened. But he, he took counsel, and here's the enemy. Now, God had already told him, if you follow me, I'll establish your house. He didn't have to worry about them turning and going back to the house of David. God already made him a promise to the prophet that if you follow me, I will establish your house. So this is the enemy working in, influencing the people to go and sin again. And the Bible says, essentially, he made worship more convenient for them. You don't got to go all the way down there. <laughs> Ooh, that's why I said I could settle here and preach all night about churches trying to make worship convenient. Just sit at home and watch it on your TV. All of you who are watching my live stream, I love you today. <laughs> I thank you for watching. If you can't be in the house of God, I understand. But if you can, come to the house of God. Worship is not supposed to be convenient. It's supposed to be sacrifice. Now, what he is setting up here is the genesis or the beginning of what Jesus has to deal with in the New Testament. Because he comes to a woman at the well. Anybody remember this story? Comes to a woman at the well. And, 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 and once, once he, she perceived that he's a prophet, she starts telling him about what she thinks. Our fathers say that we should worship in this mountain. But you guys say at Jerusalem. What is she talking about? She's talking about this system of worship that Jeroboam has just established. Because they, he's changed where the worship takes place. And this, the Samaria would be where the northern kingdom was. So the Samaritans had a mix of the commandments of God and idolatry. That's why Jesus said, you worship, you know not what you worship. We know what we worship for the salvation is of the Jews. This is the start of that. Because what they did, they took the commandments of God and mixed in the golden calf. They took the commandments of the Bible and mixed in Baal worship. He even went as far to create his own feast. God has a feast in the seventh month. I'll put mine in the eighth month. God's is on the 15th day of the seventh month. I'll make mine on the 15th day of the eighth month. And the Bible says he did that out of his own heart. He's just making up stuff. <laughs> Glory to God. And caused them to sin. Horrible. Yes, sir. Yeah, correct. So he's defiling Bethel, which is where the ladder was. You probably remember that back in Genesis 28. So this sets a precedent for the northern kingdom. Hear me. The northern kingdom never has a good king. By good, I mean a king that followed God fully. They didn't have one. Judah has a few, but they also have some dummies as well. I say that in the most respectful way I can possibly say that about the king of Israel. Because if you don't follow God and you go into idolatry, that's not very wise. And so this sets a precedent. Now, Ahab and Jezebel are going to come through the northern kingdom because they have already given themselves over to idols immediately. We're not even out of the chapter, chapter 12, and they're already worshiping golden calves. And the Bible says, verse 31, made in high house places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. So they have their own priests already. <laughs> they have their own houses already. It got a completely, totally different system because he will not forbid them to come down and worship at, at Jerusalem. So this is going to kick off what we're going to talk about next time. We're going to skip ahead in the book of Kings quite a bit. And we'll go to talking about. Uh, Elijah. Elijah. And for your homework question is, uh, what clan was Elijah from? Clan. I didn't say tribe. I said clan. Uh, from Egypt. He came, Jeroboam came out of Egypt. He fled down to Egypt until Solomon was dead. Then when Solomon was dead, he came up out of Egypt. Yes. Yes. So the homework question for next week is, what clan was Elijah from? What clan? Yeah. Now, if you're, if you're a Bible study or Bible student, 
um, what we just read here today is a good demarcation because from this point on, God is going to address Israel and Judah differently. He's going to address Israel by Israel and Judah by Judah. He's also going to send prophets to particular ones. So if you go read the prophets, Amos, Obadiah, Hosea, all those guys, they prophesied to different kingdoms at different times. So when you read them, read which king they prophesied to, reference it in Chronicles, then you'll understand more fully why God is saying to them what he's saying to them. It'll put the two together, and you'll understand the northern kingdom was full of idolatry, and God is going to use those Old Testament prophets to call them out. Powerful stuff. Any questions before we close up tonight? Nope. Pretty cut and dry. Huh? Oh, yeah. That's what the Bible studies for. It's meant to spark spark a, something in you to go back and read it yourself and read on further. Huh? For the homework question, what book? It's going to be in First Kings. First Kings, yeah. Yes, sir, Brother Bill. Mm -hmm. Yep, that one's lost. Yeah, it's a real book. They lost it. We don't know where it is. Mm -hmm. Not all of them are lost. Some of them they have. They're not included in canon or what would be what, uh, the Old Testament, at least. Um, but these were scrolls that were kind of like Kind of like First, Second Chronicles were. This particular one, I looked up to try to find it, but it it was lost and was lost by the time of Jesus. Like they don't have a record of this scroll, so we're talking about thousands of years. Yes, sir. Good question. It's good. Good observation. You, you'll see that a lot. Book of this and book of this. Some of them they have. Um, most of them they don't. Homework question again for next week. What clan was Elijah from? You'll see it very quickly once you read him, read his introduction. Amen. All right. Y'all are kind of kind of kind of kind of silent tonight. I'm, I'm getting a little worried. I'm, I don't think I'm in the right building. It was a mashed potatoes, wasn't it? It'll shut you up. Thank you, Sister Billy, for the mashed potatoes. We appreciate you greatly. In Jesus' name. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of uh, wisdom you can pull out of this particular because a lot's happening, you know. Idolatry and the splitting of the of the kingdom, and it's <coughs> yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. All right, let's pray out tonight, and we'll be done in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we love you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, Lord, for your wisdom that you've released upon us tonight, Lord. And I pray tonight, Lord God, that. We would be far from idolatry, Lord Jesus, oh God, and not cause ourselves a, to be a stumbling block, Lord Jesus, against ourselves, Lord God. But I pray today, Lord, that every strange and false God, Lord God, would be placed from us, Lord God, that we would worship and serve you alone, Lord Jesus, oh God. And we pray tonight, Lord God, that you continue to keep your hand upon us, Lord, to get victory over all of our adversaries, Lord God, oh God, to execute judgments upon those that would oppose your will, Lord God, to bring growth to your kingdom, Lord God. We want your will to be done, Lord. Help us to do it, Lord Jesus, Father. And I pray tonight, as we leave this place, Lord, that you give us traveling mercies, Lord God, to make it home safely, Lord. We we want to do your will, Lord God. We thank you for all that you are and all that you've done in our lives. We'll be careful to give you the glory, to give you the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.